Bless you, man. Yeah, it's good to be here today to, to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And I want to, you know, kind of piggyback on some things that have already been stated, and that is to wish Marcy and Keith a very happy wedding anniversary that they are celebrating. And it's, it's always a blessing to be able to, to see people who are still hanging in there, still together, still working through the good times as well as the bad times, still honoring Christ and honoring the vows that they made before him and the assembly that is present when they got married. So congratulations. It's my prayer that God would bless you all with many more years of marriage. Amen. Amen. Marriage is an honorable thing. And the marriage bed is undefiled. Amen. Their family has really been a blessing in my life. Kids, they've been a blessing to me. I think I've seen at least three of them I know <laughs> that uh, have grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevon, he was already he was already running around along with my son. Back in the day, in the old Bethel days, yeah, yeah. And, but the other three, the three youngest, I, I think I've seen each one of you all grow up mm -hmm. since you were babies. Yeah, man. And you all have turned out to be excellent young men and young ladies, so future young ladies, young women. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my prayer is that God will continue to bless you all and keep your entire family. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that Sister Yvonne, she, she celebrated a birthday. <laughs> she celebrated a birthday on yesterday. Amen. So, Sister Yvonne, we want to say happy birthday to you. Amen. Amen. Pray God bless you with many, many more. Sister Yvonne is uh, she's one of the uh, Bible study warriors. That's right. That's right. That's right. Sister Yvonne, she she be here. She, 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 rain, snow, sleep. That's right. Shine. Except when she got something else going on like work. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> so we thank God for allowing Sister Yvonne to. Uh, celebrate her birthday yesterday Amen. and then Sister Jill Sister Jill Masden you're going to be celebrating a birthday this week and so both you and Sister Yvonne are turning 25 <laughs> you, Yvonne turned 25 on yesterday <laughs> 25 starting with mom because <laughs> As everybody knows, here at the Mount Zion Baptist Church, everybody's 25. <laughs> <laughs> With the exception of those who are under 25. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, so I praise God for you all, and I pray that the Lord bless each and every one of you all. More days to come. Amen. Yeah. If you have your Bibles, I would ask that you turn with me, coming back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, we're going to be making our way to verses 15 and 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But really, to set this in context this morning, I am going to take the liberty to read starting at verse 13, and we'll read all the way down to verse 16, mm -hmm. just to set this in context, and I'll be reading from the NASB. Um, could everyone signal that they had those verses by saying amen? Amen. amen. All right, 
I'll begin reading. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, mm -hmm. which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. And you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, mm -hmm. hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. The result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. My Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and... We're going to put a tag on this text, remaining faithful in tough times, and this is part three, remaining faithful in tough times, part three. Mm -hmm. And beloved, one of the more common things that can happen when we are going through a season of tough times, is to be misunderstood. Well, this usually happens when we express ourselves to someone or some people about what we are experiencing during the season of tough times. And while we are expressing ourselves, sometimes it feels as if we are not being heard clearly. Hmm. You ever been in a situation like that before? Where you feel like the words that are coming out of your mouth are not reflecting what is actually going on in your heart accurately? And at the same time, the person that you are talking to is not understanding the words clearly that are coming from your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then, beloved, there are times that when we are confiding in someone about a tough time that we are experiencing, we are often misunderstood and not given the space nor the time to explain ourselves fully. And if we would be honest today, going through a tough time can at times feel as though we are on a roller coaster with highs and low points that we encounter. And, and what we may be thinking in our heads when we're going through a tough time is not always what we want to say. Mm -hmm. And so it's during those times that we are often misunderstood. And when we are misunderstood, you know, sometimes those we are talking to and trying to receive encouragement from simply tell us just to get over it. Mm. Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Mm -hmm. Or if, if, if they're not telling us just to get over it, they're telling us anecdotally that it's going to get better. And the reality is just getting over it is not where we are in this season of our lives. Because what we are truly experiencing is really difficult for us 
to come to grips with. And although we know in Christ one way or the other, because we know that all things work together for the good of them who love him and are called according to his purpose, we know it's going to get better. Come on. Whatever better is for us. Yet at the same time, have you ever felt as though whatever better is seems so far away from happening? And so, beloved, when we find ourselves in a tough time, we are oftentimes vulnerable to, to people who want to hurt us rather than help us. Mm -hmm. And you may be asking, uh, well, why is this important? Well, the reason this is important is because when we come to this text before us that I've read, we, we find a group of saints who were going through a tough time. Yes, they were facing a tough time as a result of their faith. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you are facing tough times as a result of your faith, there are times in which you are going to be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. You ever get amongst some family members and you begin to stand or take a stand on scripture. And because you're taking a stand on something that is clearly spoken about in scripture, they begin to misunderstand the reason behind why you, why you are taking the stand that you're taking on Scripture at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. So what will usually happen is, is those, those individuals will begin to distance themselves from you. Yes, sir. And if they don't distance themselves from you, they will begin to demean you though your faith in Christ is not important. Amen, Lord. And so when we find this church before us, they were in a situation because they were a young church. They were relatively new converts to Christ. And as a result of being new converts to Christ, they were being persecuted for their faith in Christ Jesus. And the interesting thing, beloved, is that the persecution that they were facing was coming from some folk who were religious. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the, the persecution that they were facing was coming from some individuals that our text calls Jews. And the story of their persecution doesn't just begin here in 1 Thessalonians, but the story of their persecution begins in Acts, the 17th chapter. You all should be very familiar with this story because I've repeated this story a few times since we've been in 1 Thessalonians. And in Acts, the 17th chapter, the Apostle Paul came to town. Yep his missionary journey, and, and as it was his custom, the Apostle Paul would go to the local synagogue and he would preach the gospel. Yet in Acts 17 and 4, what we find is as a result of the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel, there were some converts to Christ. Well, Specifically, the Bible says there was a large number of God-fearing Greeks number of leading women. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't long after the Apostle Paul began to preach and those individuals who became Christian, they began to begin, they began to become persecuted for their faith. Man. Folk were probably misunderstood as to what is this newfound thing that they have attached themselves to. What implications does this have for our relationship with them now that they have made Jesus mm -hmm. their Savior right. and their Lord? And so in Acts 17, 5, 
The Bible tells us. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed the mob mm -hmm. and set the city in an uproar. My God. Don't tell me what folk won't do to you. That's right. Because they know that you faithfully follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Yes, these, these saints, they experience this persecution from Jews. Mm -hmm. And beloved, we got to say at the outset, I mean, we just got to nip this thing in the bud from the beginning. And that is, we've got to be firm in our conviction that anti-Semitism has no place in the body of Christ. I mean, because we, we're talking about a specific people group here. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be firm in that conviction that we cannot use the Bible as a platform, as a means to hate other people well, who have been made in the image of God. Amen. If I can make it plain for you, I just simply tell you that racism and prejudice have no place in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Because the fact is, you can't be an anti-Semite and call yourself a Christian. Amen. Yeah, we, we, we can't be racist and call ourselves Christians. Right. So racist theology is antithetical to the gospel message. Uh -huh. We got to do all we can Come on. to stamp it out whenever it raises its ugly head. It. So these saints at Thessalonica, they were being persecuted for their faith. Yet, these saints, beloved, they, they remained faithful during this tough time. And if we're going to remain faithful in tough times, we've got to recognize persecution for what it is and what it does. Right. Hmm. I mean, persecution is hostile to the gospel. Persecution is hostile to the Christian message. Persecution is a hindrance and persecution heaps up the full measure of sins. But we gotta remember that's right. His wrath is his coming. So to remain faithful during tough times, we must know that there's going to be hostility to the gospel message. Mm -hmm. Unless you've been living under a rock the last few years of your life, although we may not be experiencing the same kind of persecution as our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, there is hostility and increasing hostility to the gospel message. Yeah. Yes. People do not want to hear that they need to repent of their sins. Right, sir. People don't want to be told that there is only one way to be saved. Well, People do not want to hear about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. And no one coming to the Father except by Him. Well, Go into your public place, a place, and begin to tell folk about who Jesus really is, mm -hmm. and watch the frowns that you get. Come on, Doc. Yeah, I wish you would go to CNN and tell Don and Lemon, who said Jesus, by his own admission, was not perfect. Go ahead, go tell him. Well. That Jesus was sinless and that he needs to repent. And watch how watch how much hostility you face as a Christian for telling him that he needs to repent mm -hmm. and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. 
So we know there's hostility to the messengers of the gospel, but there's also the love to remain faithful. During tough times, we've got to recognize that there are hindrances to the, to the message of the gospel. Listen, people will not be hostile to the gospel message. Mm -hmm. People will take the additional step and they will begin to put up barriers to the gospel message being proclaimed in its authenticity. Mm -hmm. Listen, there are individuals who are preaching. But not everybody who's preaching is preaching the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. That's right. That's right. So those are the individuals that you see getting put before you. You know, we love the smiling Texan. <laughs> you know, he can fill arenas full of people. Say that. And everybody thinks, you know, we just come together and we sing kumbaya, and it's all good. Because all you got to do is just live your best life now. Come on, mm -hmm. sir. Mm -hmm. See, that's the kind of stuff that the media wants to put before us. Mm -hmm. Then, if you truly stand on the word of God, well, they will do all they can. Not only the media, but this cultural system that we live in, it will do all that it can. To truncate the message and, and silence the message and label those who stand on the word of God in its authenticity, in, in its authenticity, and label us as crazy people. Wow. As uh, people who need to be stayed away from. And so, remember, there's going to be hostility. There's going to be a, he, a hindrance to the gospel message. But then, we've got to also remember that wild folks are being hostile. The wild folk are hindering the gospel message. Mm -hmm. They, at the same time, are heaping up to the full measure Sin resulting in the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. So, beloved, as we track our way through these particular two verses, just two verses this morning, it's going to be helpful for us to remember these, these three H words, hostility, hindrance, and heaping up. And you may ask, what, what hostility? <clears throat> I say hostility because of what Paul says in verse 15. And to understand what the Apostle Paul says in verse 15, we've got to understand what he said in verse 14. Because uh, contextually, 15 and 14 go together. Amen. And so in verse 14, Paul wrote, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ that are in Judea, for you also endured the same suffering in Judea. And this hostility, as the text says, it, it was coming from the Jews. Now, this doesn't mean every single Jew who has lived since this particular time in history. This is referring to specifically these particular Jews that were living during the time of the Apostle Paul. These were the ones who were persecuting Christians at this particular moment in time. Man. And what you may be asking, well, why is this important? The reason why this is important because there is a stream of thought out there that says that the Apostle Paul was anti-Semitic. Well. And the reason people believe that the Apostle Paul was anti-Semitic is because of what he wrote in verse 15. In verse 15 is a continuation of what he wrote in verse 14. In verse 14, he ended, if you look at verse 14, he ended with the word Jews. B 
this verse 15, he continues in that particular vein when he wrote in when he, where he writes, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. And so, beloved, we've got to be clear in this. And that is calling Jewish people Christ killers. Mm -hmm. as, been as it has been done down through the ages is something that cannot be done. And the reason it ought not to be done is because it's simply unbiblical. Because again, this is not a reference to every single Jewish person who has ever lived on the planet Earth. I mean, after all, the Apostle Paul was a Jew. Yes. So, beloved, we've got to balance what the Apostle Paul says in, in this particular verse here with what he says in Romans chapters 9 to 11 about his kindred according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul, he loved his brethren according to the flesh so much that he wished if it was possible for him to lose his salvation in order for them to be saved. So, love, we got to distinguish the, the nation of Israel from individuals who are committing certain acts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the nation of Israel has experienced a temporary hardening until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Amen. And so, beloved, what we need to know is, is God is not through with Israel yet. Oh, come on. Come on. God has not totally rejected his people. Even though the nation of Israel remains primarily a secular nation that is opposed to the gospel message, God still has a remnant there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as the word of God says in Isaiah chapter 10 verse 22, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is a remnant that shall be saved not all ethnic Jews will be saved simply because they are descendants of Abraham. Come on. Rather, beloved, it is the remnant of believing Jews who have been chosen by God. That's the reason why you see Messianic Jews. These are individuals who believe that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Messiah. Well, they believe that Jesus is Savior and the Lord. And so, beloved, all we can say to this is God's ways are not our ways. Well, and neither are his thoughts our thoughts. And so the certain acts of, of individuals doesn't represent an entire group of people. This is something that can be applied to all people groups. Just because somebody goes and commits a heinous crime from one people group doesn't mean that we ought to paint with broad brush strokes right. and say this is something that is prevalent across this particular group. Because just because one person does something from a a particular people group doesn't mean that this is characteristic of the group as a whole. Good. So when we come back to the text, we find some Jews who are being referred to as Christ killers and prophet killers. However, when we began to look at who really killed Jesus? 
Oh, it's much more complex than just throwing out names at certain people groups. Uh -huh. I mean, Judas Iscariot was used by Satan to betray him. Yes. Well, Some Jewish leaders sought to have Jesus murdered. They didn't do it themselves, but they forced the hand of Pontius Pilate to and they incited the crowd to say, crucify Jesus and give us Barabbas. Mm -hmm. So Pontius Pilate, because he wanted to please the crowd, he gave them Pontius Pilate and he handed Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. So it was actually the Roman soldiers who carried out the execution. Right. Yet, beloved, it's even more deeper than that. Because uh, when we have an understanding of the nature of sin and how the penalty of sin needed to be paid hmm. because the holiness of God was offended. Right. How the wrath of God needed to be satisfied we can only come to the conclusion mm -hmm. that it was all our sin come on, God, man. that killed Jesus. Yes, so, sir. It was all our sin Say it, sir. that put him on the cross. Yes, sir. I'm reminded that there is an old Negro spiritual that asks the question, were you there mm -hmm. yeah, when they crucified come on, God. my Lord? may not have been there physically mm -hmm. but we were there spiritually in our father who is Adam mm -hmm. so every human being who has ever lived and, and sinned against the holy God is responsible for the death of Jesus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you really want to go deeper and understand who is responsible for the death of Christ, you ultimately got to look to God the Father. I mean, he was offended. His, his wrath needed to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And it was God the Father who permitted his son to be mm -hmm. crucified on the cross. That's right. That's right. Yes, and in Acts chapter 2, Verse 23, it says that this was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Yet God raised him up. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. It was Isaiah the prophet who said it was the will of the Lord yeah. to bruise ah. him. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, beloved, it wasn't every single Jew who has ever lived who killed Jesus. Uh, Long Jesus. It may have been some Jews that handed him over to the Roman soldiers uh, to be crucified. But we all have some responsibility because we all have sinned Amen. and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, sir. Amen. So it wasn't just Jesus, but it was also the prophets. Think about the prophets in the Old Testament. Think about the persecution that they had to go through, the trouble that they had to endure in order to proclaim the word of God, in order to proclaim, thus says the Lord. Well, well. I'm reminded also that the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, he says it this way, they were stoned. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. Mm -hmm. So what was true for Jesus was true for the prophets. And what was true for Jesus and the prophets was true for the apostle Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Mm -hmm. And you know what else? It'll also be true for us. Amen. See, because Paul says... The hostility that they faced was so great that it drove them out. My God. 
If you go back to Acts 17, you'll find that this mob, after they ran the Apostle Paul and his companions out of Thessalonica, Paul ran to Berea. And not satisfied with finding the Apostle Paul in Berea, in, in, uh, Berea, they chased him on to the point that he had to go to Athens. And Paul probably understood this level of religious zeal very well. And the reason why he, he probably understood this level of religious zeal very well because before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. That's right. And when he was Saul of Tarsus, he felt like he was doing God a service mm -hmm. as he persecuted Christians. He felt like he was doing God a service when he gave the okay for Stephen to be stoned. Yes, Paul, by his own admission, was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Well. And as a Pharisee, the Apostle Paul persecuted the church. And, and you know, beloved, sometimes I believe that, that, that persecution is too light of a word to use for what the Apostle Paul tried to do to the church. Well. Yes, the Apostle Paul wanted to destroy the church. And he was passionate for his religion of Judaism. He said it himself that he was extremely zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And he would vehemently oppose anyone who came up against what he believed because what he believed at the time, he thought it was the right thing. My God. In other words, he thought he was pleasing God. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that the Apostle Paul was not pleasing God. And the text says as well as about the, about the Jews who were persecuting the Thessalonians or the saints at Thessalonica. Mm. It says they were not pleasing God, but hostile to all men. But later on, after his conversion, Paul said, you know what? I am what I am by the grace of God. That's it, God. Good word. And what this should remind us of, beloved, is that we ought not to never forget where the Lord has brought us from. Amen. We should never forget. Yes, sir. That it was the Lord who brought us out of darkness yes, into his marvelous light. Yes, because if the truth be told, if we were living back during the times of the Apostle Paul and I, with our unsaved self, we'd be running with Paul trying to persecute the church as well. So we should never forget what God has done for us. Amen. Because we are what we are by the grace of God. Yes, sir. And if we're going to be anything, mm -hmm. it's going to be because of the grace of God. Go to work, dog. Because Go to his work. grace is his unmerited favor. His grace is his undeserved gift. And if we were to testify in here today, we all would be <laughs> grace cases. Yes, because none of us are anything without the grace of God. So we see, beloved, there was hostility, yet there was also a hindrance as well. As I said earlier, persecution is not just hostility, a hindrance. The next step in hindering the gospel message My to God. restrain it, hold it back. And beloved, the, the message was restrained because they didn't want folk to be saved. Amen. That's what it says in 16a. Mm -hmm. 
hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. They didn't want anybody to be saved. Folk who are hindering the message today don't want anybody to be saved. You want to know why folk are hostile to the gospel message? You want to know why folk are hindering the gospel message? Because they ultimately don't want anyone to be saved. And to be saved is to be delivered. To be saved is to be set free. Question we got to ask ourselves is uh, saved and delivered from what? Mm -hmm. It was the late R.C. Sproul who I believe said it accurately in his book, Saved from What? When he talks about a time where he was encountered by somebody who was trying to present him with the gospel message even as he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And as the gentleman began to unpack his, uh, his story about why R.C. Sproul needed to be saved, R.C. Sproul said, saved from what? And later on in the book, he begins to say that the very one who saves us mm -hmm. is the very one that we need to be saved from. Mm -hmm. Yes, the very one who, who saves us mm -hmm. is the very one that we need to be saved from. Mm -hmm. Yes, beloved, we are being saved from the wrath of God mm -hmm. that is to come. That's what it means to be saved in a nutshell. Yes, we are saved from our sins. Christ has paid the penalty for our sins. Mm -hmm. We are saved from the power of sin. And one day when Jesus returns, we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand who was offended in the first place. Mm -hmm. You can't be saved unless you understand who you offended in the first place. Being saved is not about getting fire insurance. Because well. <laughs> you know how folk want to compartmentalize their lives. Uh -huh. You know, I need homeowner's insurance. I need car insurance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure I get some fire insurance. And I need a lawyer and I need a doctor. This is not what salvation is about. No, no. <laughs> it's understanding that your sin has offended a holy God. Amen. And because our sin has offended a holy God, we need to repent and believe the gospel and so be saved. Come on. And beloved, the wrath of God is what is unpacked in Verse 16b. Do you see it right there? See, the gospel is not just about Jesus loves you mm -hmm. and that he has a wonderful plan for your life yeah. and that he wants to give you a big old shiny car and a nice house and give you a wonderful family. You can get that stuff and don't even follow Jesus. That's right. That's right. You don't need Jesus to get a big house. No. You don't need Jesus to get a nice shiny car. Preach that. You don't need Jesus to get a good job. Preach it. Work, go there work. are pagans that got good jobs. Uh -huh. I know pagans that got big houses. Yes, sir. Uh, nice big shiny cars. Yes, sir. Come on, sir. I know pagans that got great families. Uh huh. Kids go to school, do what the teacher says, get good grades, and they're not thinking about Jesus. No, no. Uh, so salvation has to be more than something materialistic that we can get in this life. Yeah, man. If you look with me, the word of God says in verse 16b with the result that they will always fill up the measure of their sins. 
soon. But the wrath has come upon them to the utmost. Do you see that? I mean, we, we see the hostility. We know about the hindrance. And, and sometimes, beloved, in the middle of the hostility and the hindrances that we are seeing, it sometimes makes us blind that God has set a limit on how long he's going to let this mess go on. Amen. Amen. We forget that if you know your Bible, it's not long. God is not going to allow this to go on long. Come on, preacher. Folk can heat up, store up, measure up. The, the, the text says in verse 16, it says, fill up. Fill up the measure. But think about it this way. Keep up the measure. Gathering up the full measure of their sin. It results in the wrath of God coming upon them to the utmost. Mm -hmm. Listen, folk better watch out. Be yeah. watched out. To those who bring glad tidings. Yeah, God. Folk better watch out mm. trying to hinder the gospel message. Oh, mm. And the reason being, beloved, is the wrath of God has come. Uh -huh. And the wrath of God is coming. The word picture 